So just with respect to disclosures, we did receive a patent for the mathematical formula for the residual cancer burden uh, about 11 years ago. And um, at, at f from the very beginning, uh, the residual cancer burden has been a freely and publicly available uh, website tool uh, and will continue to be so. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, so the path of, this is really about organizing the workflow in pathology uh, to standardize the way we evaluate response after uh, several months of neoadjuvant treatment. And all of these data relate to post-chemotherapy response. And the basic principle is that we estimate the area that still contains residual disease, map that area to the slides that we'll be looking at in the mic under the microscope, and create an image so that we can really reconstruct it, uh, and then be able to determine what area still contains actual cancer under the microscope. And then we combine that with the fraction of that area that still contains cancer cells that are invasive, as well as the number of positive lymph nodes and the size of the largest metastasis. So there's no special testing here. This is just organizing what we would otherwise report anyway in pathology, but doing it in a quantitative and standardized manner. And the website, uh, you enter these, these, uh, six, uh, these uh, six variables, and um, you get a hit calculate, and you get a residual cancer burden score, where zero would be a pathologic complete response, i.e. no cancer left. Uh, and uh, in any increasing score above zero means there's some cancer left. And that is then um, categorized into a class. There are three classes, one, two, and three, minimal, moderate, and extensive disease. The website calculator page uh, gets visited quite frequently. Um, it's just breached 16,000 visits per month. Uh, so it's being used out there. We don't know how many patients that actually affects um, because it could be visited multiple times uh, per patient experience. But, but it is being used, uh, and the website has instructional videos and educational materials uh, and protocols and illustrations and, and the diagrams I showed on the previous slide to really be there as a resource for pathologists uh, who are uh, using this or training people how to use it. <clears throat> so the purpose of this study was a multi-institutional pooled analysis. It was really led by ourselves and Laura Esserman, who leads the iSpy consortium, uh, which we participate very actively together. And Laura's in the room here, if there's any questions um, in the discussion. And so we, we, we identified sites and convened sites that had we knew had an experience with this. Uh, and two of those sites, the iSpy is a prospective trial. That's the only one that's really using it prospectively, collecting it prospectively in their trial. And the Cancer Research UK Artemis randomized trial did a central review of RCB. Uh, and so there's two trials embedded within this, within this consortium of 5,160 uh, uh, patients' responses. Sort of the headline uh, result here, the most interesting result, to my opinion, is that when you look at the residual cancer burden index score, as we're showing on the x-axis, and you look at a function of survival, or in this case it's the risk, uh, on the y-axis, it's plotted on a log scale. You can see a log linear relationship here. Now the implication of this result is that you can take an individual patient's score of how much residual cancer burden they have and calibrate that to an accurate estimate of their risk over time. And the scale on the y-axis, as I said, is, is on a log scale. It's the relative risk of an event relative to patients who had a pathologic complete response, who had a complete, you know, had no disease left. So the classes of residual cancer burden are, are shown uh, in this plot by the vertical cutoffs, and the classes are indicated at the top of the graph. These classes uh, stratify risk in terms of event-free survival and distant relapse-free survival, almost identical results. So we pretty much just carried on with event-free survival as proof of principle for the further analyses, which is to look at the subtypes of disease. <clears throat> and when we look in triple negative breast cancer, which this audience knows is the most uh, aggressive, naturally aggressive form of breast cancer, we see the classes clearly and, and, and strongly separating future prognostic risk. Uh, but I, I, I will point out that the tables that were, the format of the tables we're showing in the subtypes have the frequency in the white rows, 
uh, the five-year event-free survival estimate and confidence interval in the grey rows and the 10-year um, estimates in the black rows. And so one of the points here is that about half the patients get a PCR or an RCB1. In this case, it's 55% in this series. Uh, uh, but we did find in this large meta-analysis that there was a, a, a lower um, survival probability in the RCB1 compared to the PCR in triple negative breast cancer. In hormone receptor negative HER2 positive breast cancer, the patients who received uh, HER2 targeted therapy as part of their neoadjuvant treatment, we see f a couple of striking findings. First of all, nearly 70% of these patients had a pathologic complete response, just really illustrating how effective these current treatments are. And um, the 20% of patients who had an RCP2 in gray or an RCP3 in, um, in, in red uh, have a significantly worse survival than, than, than the rest. So a small residual, a small quintile of patients still at fairly substantial risk. And when we look at hormone receptor positive HER2 positive breast cancer, again, we see the RCB classes are stratifying the risk. Um, it's quite the interesting point to note here, I think, is that the RCB1, the yellow curve, really track with complete response for approximately five years. And then there are some later events uh, that we observed in this, in this uh, population. And in hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer, where I think there still remains a bit of residual uh, confusion about whether or not chemotherapy can help patients with this type of disease, we see that the, the, um, the extent of residual disease is strongly prognostic. Uh, so, so there's clearly uh, an effect uh, on prognosis from the chemotherapy. But, but the most prognostic aspects of the distribution of response are in the, it, when there's the most residual disease, the RCB3 in, in red and the RCB2 in grey. And it's a long-term risk that's still continuing beyond 10 years. <clears throat> and coming, returning to this continuous relationship with the log of risk, uh, we can see in each of the subtypes, in the order that I presented them from left to right, triple negative, hormone receptor negative, HER2 positive, hormone receptor positive, HER2 positive, and on the farthest right, hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, we see that that's, that strong relationship with risk uh, is, is, is very clear in each and every subtype of disease. It's, look how perfectly linear that risk curve, that log linear risk curve is for the triple negative at left, and very tight confidence intervals around those risk estimates. On the farthest right, the hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, this is the, this is the group where you get a slight sway to the right uh, of, on the curve rather than a true diagonal linear effect. And we're interpreting that as the influence of adjuvant endocrine treatment, uh, but that will obviously deserve further study. And so in multivariate analysis uh, with pre-treatment clinical and pathologic parameters, uh, we learned the following, that in each of the subtypes, residual cancer burden index was independently significant that a small minority of patients who present with T4 extensive disease in the breast still remain at significant risk um, in, uh, independently. They're, they're a small group, but, but it's a dangerous group. Uh, and that in hormone receptor positive HER2 negative, pink on the farthest right, that the clinical nodal status before treatment and the histologic grade of the tumour remain prog add, continue to add independent prognostic information. And in the triple negative breast cancer, blue on the farthest left, uh, you can see that compared to the T2 presentation, the T3, the larger uh, pr uh, popula uh, tumour size, uh, still adds some additional independent uh, risk to the, to the multivariate model. So to conclude, the prognostic association of residual cancer burden, both the index score and the class, was generalizable across a very large multi-center uh, pooled analysis. And it, it adds, oh, I didn't show these data, but they're in the presentation. It adds prognostic information to the stage categories. Residual cancer burden was prognostic in each phenotypic subtype of disease. It's independent of pretreatment, clinical and pathologic information. Uh, and we also just want to highlight hormone receptor positive HER2 negative. Some of these pretreatment clinical uh, characteristics remain prognostic. But the most important conclusion uh, in my mind for the here and now is that there's a strong potential to calibrate an individual's residual cancer burden index score 
to her residual prognostic risk. Uh, there is a generally linear relationship between RCB index value and the log of risk, and that there it is, as we've demonstrated, it is entirely feasible to have phenotype-specific calibration risk curves uh, for use in the communication of risk and the interpretation of clinical trials. Thank you. Thank you.